Oliver, es la primera vez que estabas en Venezuela luego de la muerte de Hugo Chávez. ¿Cómo has percibido el país? Has, how has, uh, you, have you seen the country? ¿Has tenido la oportunidad de hablar con algunos de sus más importantes líderes? ¿Has been uh, able to talk to some of the, of the most important leaders and companions of President Chavez? You know, I wouldn't know. I've only been here for two days, and I'm not an expert. And you, you have to talk to, you have to be in a country. I, all I can talk to you about is, I miss uh, Hugo Chavez. I miss his spirit. And his presence, he walking over a room, you knew he was the uh, El Jefe, but in a good way, not in a dictatorial way. Uh, he had a, a beautiful spirit to serve the people. I felt that the first time I met him, but I knew it the more and more I talked to him. But what I'm getting this trip is talking to many of the people who I didn't really know. They were around the scene. Uh, they were in his office, but I didn't know them uh, the way I know them now in his absence. And what's impressed me very much. Is that okay? Uh, so you go. And what's impressed me very much is that although they all miss him, they are ready, they're carrying on independently as adults. It's as if uh, they were no longer the son or daughter or the children of, they are now Chavez's. And every one of them, to some degree, has expressed the idea that we, we are Chavez, which is a beautiful legacy to leave behind. And, a, and he should be proud of it, I think. I was worried that when Hugo died, there would be a personality cult, that he was running the government too much, doing everything, and that the people were not ready to take take control. I think I was wrong. And I, I think only for two days, but talking to people, and I'm very uh, optimistic about uh, uh, President Maduro and Vice President uh, Elias and uh, all the ministries that I've seen and the young intelligence chief, uh, Morales, who was once uh, Hugo's uh, assistant. Amazing story. Uh, Good-looking people. Strong people. People in the streets look happy. They don't look, you know, everyone, life is not easy for anybody any, in New York City or Paris or here. It's just people bitch. But I don't notice any more bitching than usual. And uh, I think to some degree, some people who probably hated him, probably miss him in a way. They do miss him because he was such a presence. Estamos haciendo esta entrevista, teniendo esta conversación en la Cancillería de Venezuela, muy cerca de la Plaza Bolívar, y mientras tú contestabas, había mucha gente haciendo militancia y gritando allí justo en la Plaza Bolívar. Es un poco de lo que se vive en, el, en este país. La gente sale a hacer política a, a cada hora, a cada momento, a cada lugar. ¿Cómo tú conociste a Hugo Chávez? Un hombre que vivía haciendo política. ¿Cómo, cómo lo, lo encontraste? ¿Cómo se cruzó? Tuve su camino y él... ¿Cómo lo conocí? Solo porque había hecho tres documentarios en ese momento, en realidad, con Fidel Castro y otro documentario con Yasser Arafat. Castro le dijo a Hugo que era un biógrafo y que presencia que le gustó. They were both military men, and they, I think to some degree, because I had been in the military and served in Vietnam, that there was respect that was already there for a military person. Uh, my, my, uh, I got into such hot water interviewing Fidel Castro in America that it affected my career to some degree. That was the fault of Fernando Guilla and uh, Mad Max, but... You know, anyway, I was trying to survive those flaws, but my career did take a hit for uh, being uh, involved with Castro. And some people saw me as, you know, a communist. I'm just but uh, so uh, when we came here, uh, we came here originally to uh, be a part of the hostage rescue mission in Colombia with the Red Cross and Nestor Kirchner. Uh, Several diplomats and myself uh, went to the Colombian border. We met with Hugo up here, and he was orchestrating the release from FARC of Colombian hostages, which failed. It was aborted at the last second. And I got to know him, and we came back afterward, and we shot a uh, 
south of the border. Yeah, now that uh, was intended to be about all the president's changes in South America after 2000. And Hugo was the anchor and gave us not only a great interview because he's a lovely, he's a great interview, but he gave us access to the seven other presidents. Uh, and with his blessing, uh, we were able quickly to do a road trip around the continent and gather together the, the feelings of a new generation of leaders who were willing to go out to go out, to go at it without the United States, hopefully without the United States. Independent. A propósito de Estados Unidos y de Chávez, tuvo algo que ver esa relación suya con Hugo Chávez para pensar en hacer esta serie sobre la verdadera historia de Estados Unidos? No question that uh, we came back uh, uh, to open the movie in 2008 and somewhere in there I had talked to him about my overall plan to make a big story about the United States, uh, the untold history. It was called Secret History back then. Uh, my motivation was as a man of well, almost, uh, what was it, 60 years old, almost, that I had seen after two, eight years of George Bush in 2008. Uh, I think Hugo and I agreed that he was a terrible president. Uh, uh, Hugo talked about the smell of sulfur. At the uh, and I thought he was very witty. But my feelings about Bush is that he damaged the United States severely. But I didn't want to make a documentary about Bush. I wanted to understand where Bush was Bush an aberration or was he a continuation of a pattern, albeit exaggerated? Uh, so with my uh, historian uh, friend of, who's been teaching for 30 years at American University, Peter Kuznick, who's also the director of the Nuclear Studies Institute at American University, expert in nuclear affairs. We went at it going back in the American century to 1898 and from 1898 to 2013. We did a full five years. Uh, it was a massive project. And we were looking for where America became this international uh, global security that it's become. Castro had pointed to it to me in 2001. And again, uh, Mr. Chavez uh, pointed it out repeatedly in his analysis. But uh, we were looking at not just Latin America, really at the world. And we find that after World War II, especially, when we dropped those two atomic bombs on Japan, which were unnecessary, and we go to great lengths to show you, the audience, that it was unnecessary. It was not militarily necessary. After that moment, the United States embarked, basically, on a, a tyrannical course of empire without morality, justifying its actions by saying the enemy was worse, that the Soviet Union was communist and was far worse than we were, and we were acting defensively, which is not true either. So we started with all these myths, and we penetrated these myths from the beginning of uh, the, the reasons for World War II, the victory, what, what the, who are the real victors in World War II, what happens after World War II, the Cold War, all the way through the pre American presidents under Eisenhower in the 1950s, supposedly a very benign period in America, very rich period in American history. We find many of the abuses, many of the abuses of third world countries beginning. So these are the kind of stories we go after all the way up to now. Twelve chapters, twelve hours. Te metiste en problemas haciendo esta serie. Te has metido en problemas por filmar esta Yes, we were. At, well, first of all, I just want to say it was not easy to get done. Fernando uh, Sulici and. Uh, was uh, raised money in Latin America. Uh, Mag Mag Max Arvelas helped us a lot. These two people were, were our angels. Uh, so it was Latin finance to a large degree, although we got uh, uh, advance, advances from Showtime. 
the American Cable Company and Fremantle, England, Salesman. Showtime is an independent cable, but it was very bold of them to, to do this because most of American television would not normally take the show. It's too controversial. And frankly, it's too critical. Most of the American narrative that we have in school, history, and in television, and in commercials, generally has to be pro -America. It has to be nationalist. He has to, not doesn't have to, but generally does support the American narrative of triumph, or what we call triumphalism, the orthodox view of American history, that we assume a role after World War II thrust upon us, that we were reluctant to take it on, and that we became the tough guys only because we had to and that we are uninterested in resources, uninterested in empire, in any conventional sense of the word. They were interested in liberty, peace, freedom for all, and a world that we can beneficently control without it becoming apparent how ugly it can get when we when we push the buttons. Did you feel happy doing that series? Satisfied? Come on, brother. Satisfied? Come on, brother. Satisfied? Come on, brother. Satisfied? I have to tell you, it was the most difficult thing I've ever done in film. I we had to we had to break down a hundred and hundred and twenty years into these sections. Very difficult rewriting. Uh, first of all, we, 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 we branched out and uh, Peter t and his 10 graduate students did a book, big book, 750 pages, because we knew we were in so deep, we had to get some substantiation, we had to give details, and everything was fact-checked repeatedly, everything, including my scripts, which I rewrote with Peter and rewrote. Many times. And the film, the archive film, which was collected by Rob Wilson from around the world, uh, I think the film is cut in a way that you don't see most documentaries are cut. It's cut more like a movie. It has similarities to JFK, the section where uh, we, we, we show the documentary section of JFK. It has similarities to that style. Very interesting, cross cutting, fast directed to a younger audience, it moves fast, but it's a, it's a documentary series that is really worth seeing again because there's so much information in there that it's too much sometimes for the human brain. And I know uh, some people have benefited from a second view. Ahora estás en Caracas grabando mi amigo Hugo, me hablas de la historia no contada de Estados Unidos, me llevas atrás a JFK. Esas son las cosas que quieres seguir haciendo o vas a cambiar. Vas a Listen, I am very grateful for the experience. Uh, I learned it was like uh, going back to college and getting a PhD in history for me. I read, never read so much history in my life. Uh, and I enjoy the idea, the, the challenge of dramatizing. Uh, archival footage. It's very difficult to do what we did. If I can get a young person interested in 1920, 1930, 1960 even, and they, they watch it, it's all for the first time that they're getting this interpretation of American history. And I love that feeling of being a teacher, going to schools, and also being a dramatist because I'm not a historian. Peter is a historian. I was the dramatist. I was dramatizing very difficult material, like I did in JFK. That's a challenge. Now, whether I can do a documentary for the rest of my life, that's difficult, because I make more money, frankly, uh, as a filmmaker, because people like stories. Uh, it's funny, they'll go to these silly movies, but if they have to watch a documentary, it's like taking medicine. So sometimes it's not easy. So I, I alternate, and I deepen my awareness of life. Uh, with this study of American history. Now, I, before I did Kennedy, Nixon, Wall Street, I knew different sections. But with this movie, uh, Untold History, I think, for my sake, I brought it all, I understood the narrative, the whole picture, which is a great achievement for a lifetime because most people live their lives, they don't know who they are. Who am I? What country am I? What am I really part of? I was born in 1946, one year after the atomic bomb. Okay? I was at the center of the world, New York City. We were the top dog. We always did the right thing. We were good guys. The Russians 
Asians were going to take over the world. I grew up with that narrative and I went to Vietnam on that basis. My father was conservative. My father was Republican. He hated Kennedy. He hated Castro. He would have hated Chavez. I mean, he was a Republican on Wall Street. Look where I am now. Uh, that is a world, that is a journey. And it's a journey which has at times been very painful. But I think that's part of what life is. It's to take you from where you were born to a completely different place. Now, perhaps at the end I'll revert to being a conservative and uh, I, will, I will go take my blessings before the good, the good Lord and uh, take my absolution and die in my bed, I hope. Just joking. I think I'll always have a heart of rebellious. Yeah. I think I'll be always a rebel in some way. Yeah, like, uh, like Hugo, I think I, Hugo's spirit is in me. Relátame una puerta que se haya cerrado, de pronto un amigo que te dijo no estoy de acuerdo con que hagas estas cosas, algo que haya sido significativo en ese sentido. Well, all I can tell you is career-wise, you know, I mean, I was doing the Castro and the Chavez and the South of the world, uh, made many enemies that I didn't know I People thought that I was anti-American. When I did this, it, after, it's... It was, it's known in the, it's respected as film by people who understand film. But I have to say that people have a, an easy concept of me as anti-American. And that hurts. Because they don't want to work with you. They don't offer you the scripts. That you, you, you sometimes don't have friends in studios, for example. You know, the, you, know you offend people with, who are interested in making money. Want the American empire to continue. And want it to prosper. It's like the people on Wall Street. They're not interested in criticism of the empire and uh, they don't want to confront that so it takes a certain kind of conscience that has to be more evolved I think and not only thinking about your own self to care so you know in that regard it's like I disappeared for five years to make this movie I'm not really it's not a movie and it's a documentary on television so it's like I'm starting over again I mean people have forgotten me. It's, they don't know, they don't quite remember me, which is okay. It's like I, I have to start again, like Hugo would feel that way, you know. You, you have to win the next election, you have to do it again. So that's a pain in the ass sometimes, not to have some of that momentum. Also, Fernando has really done a lot to bring that up in your ear. Fernando is his producer who is here with us. So people know who he is. Eh, y, y a propósito de, de momentos, cuando nace mi amigo Hugo, tras la muerte de Hugo Chávez, días después, en ese instante en el que conociste la noticia, dijiste tengo que hacer algo sobre Hugo Chávez, particularmente sobre Chávez. Because the world gave him a great homage. Uh, the funeral, the pictures of the funeral itself, uh, show you how loved he was. And as many dinner party fights have had with people about democracy in Venezuela, you cannot, you cannot tell Americans. They don't understand. That there's more democracy in Venezuela than there is in America. That most of American congressional elections are gerrymandered. Gerrymandered being their control by the geographical breakdown in the computer and Republicans have been able to, to keep the white vote secure as much as they can, that racism does play a role in American uh, electoral politics. They keep black people from voting like they do some, they used to in the old Venezuela, you know, the, the same issue. And you have better electoral uh, computerization than we do in the United States. As far as I've heard, you have a paper ballot, you keep a paper ballot as well as electoral. We don't. So I, I have a little faith in the electoral process alone. I think there's a shift of 5% up to 5, maybe 10%.
Entonces, so it's, it's corrupt, very corrupt. And money and politics in the U.S. is uh, uh, What was your question? I'm sorry, I got lost. Sobre Hugo Chávez y el momento en que había decidido hacer este material, mi amigo Hugo. Yeah, yeah. To do something about uh, oh, yeah. so, uh, yeah. my friend Hugo. I'm sorry, I got off track. Yeah. Okay. No, it was uh, it was Fernando's no. idea uh, no. to uh, <laughs> Fernando being out to really wreck my career. Wanted me to go back <laughs> to Venezuela, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. and do uh, a little, a, a smaller film called My Friend Hugo, which I think is a nice title. And I'm hoping uh, from these interviews to patch together a sense of love, a sense of missing a comrade. Oliver y Fernando justamente me me contaba que tienes un gran proyecto para para hacer en las próximas semanas podrías adelantar algo sobre Well, I, uh, it's not, it's, it's, it has been uh, announced to some degree uh, that I was working on a screenplay about Martin Luther King. But this, uh, I finished it, I'm very happy with it. Many people love it. But this has political issues. Involved. And uh, you have to be united to make this movie. I don't, I don't always do it was a difficult project to make. I was involved in a project to make King's Life in 1995. And uh, it didn't happen then. And I'm not sure it's going to happen. Y no tampoco sé si se va a poder hacer ahorita, pero voy a hacer lo mejor posible para que así sea. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much. Thank you.